Amen. Well, we want to welcome you to Frontline Christian Center, and today is Palm Sunday. Amen. Very important Sunday, which means that next week is Easter. Easter. How many have invited someone to come next week? Now, here's the one Sunday that people will come to if you'll invite them. That's the key. Got to invite them. And so I want to challenge you to invite a neighbor, a friend, someone that you know and uh, invite them for Easter. If you have your Bibles and would turn with me to Luke's gospel, that's the third gospel, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So if you would turn with me to Luke's gospel, we're going to be looking at the 23rd chapter, uh, verse 46, and then we're going to look at several verses before and after that particular verse. Um, and it says this, it says, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you, uh, Lord, for the work you did at Calvary. Lord, how you redeemed us from sin. Lord, how you set us free from bondage. And Father, we are in, in a week of celebration because you rose again. You established that you're King of kings and Lord of lords. Before Abraham was, Lord, you were there. And Father, we give you praise and we give you glory. Father, anoint your servant today, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 This morning, I've entitled the message, In God's Hands. And this particular last word of Jesus is, is so incredible. Now, what is so interesting and fantastic is simply this, that Luke is the only writer of the Gospels that records this last statement of Jesus. He's the only one. You don't find it in Matthew's account. You don't find it in Mark's account. You don't find it in John's account. You find it in Luke, his meticulous and detailed pen of Dr. Luke. You may not know or remember, but Luke was a doctor. And so he's into the details. He does the research, and he wants to know not only about the life of Jesus, but he wants to know about his death and resurrection. And so Dr. Luke wants to know what was Jesus' last statement. And, and he uh, interviewed all those that were there. And, of course, we are familiar with, Father, forgive them. We know Jesus said that on the cross. He said, I thirst. He said, behold, woman, here is your son. But only Luke records this last statement. And these are the last words of Jesus. Father, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, it's not notable that Jesus died. Listen, we're all going to die someday. In fact... Uh, dying on a cross, it was kind of a sure thing. If you were going to be crucified, you were a dead man. Uh, you were as good as gone. And so Jesus died. It's interesting that none of the writers just said, well, Jesus just died. Uh, that he just expired. No. They say he breathed his last. He was ushered uh, into the spirit or the hands of Almighty God. The truth is, none of us are going to, that's what my mom used to say. My mom used to make a quote. She said, none of us are going to get out of this world alive. And she was true. All of us are going to leave this world someday. And uh, what is so amazing isn't that Jesus died. What is amazing is the way that he died. 
death did not have the last word with Jesus. Jesus had the last word with death. Death was not the master of Jesus. Jesus was master over death. And so I want us to look at this passage a little closer and look at what Luke writes. In verse 44, it says this, it was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two and Jesus called out with a loud voice. Say loud voice. I I just think that's amazing. You know, I'm a pastor. I've been at the bedside of of those loved ones, friends, family, church members who have gone to be with the Lord, not one of them shouted as they left this world. Most of the time, it's a moan or a groan or a mumble. But I just want to bring that to your attention. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed, his last breath. Now, I want to invite you this morning to think about something. And you're not going to want to think about this. But I want you to think about this. What is it going to be like when you take your last breath? Now, you may not realize it, but you are going to take a last breath. One of these days, your belly button's going to hit the floor, and it will be your last breath. It's the truth. Now, you may not know when. You may not know where. You may not know how, but you're going to take your last breath. And here's what I want you to think about. What would be on your lips? What would be in your mind? Uh, What would you be saying? And I think it's interesting that none of the New Testament writers are content just to say that Jesus died, uh, but that Jesus uh, breathed his last and went into the hands of God. Now, in other words, what Luke is trying to tell us is that, uh, you know, Jesus just didn't go out quiet in the night. He uh, didn't go out with a whimper. But it says that he cried out in a loud voice. He wanted to make go out with the bang. And death didn't have the last word. So Jesus wanted to die in the hands of God. And that's the only way to die. Trust me, church. It's the only way to die. is to die in the hands of God. To die and know that you are in the hands of God. So Jesus, in this little simple verse, it gives us three important things to help us in how or what we should know when we die, when we take our last breath. Three things that we need to know. We're going to go through these three things this morning. Number one, before you breathe your last breath, you need to be connected to the Father's heart. Need to be connected to the Father's heart. Now, every part of this verse is so important, especially that first word. Look at this first word, Father. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Father. Boy, that's so intimate. Now, what you may not realize is Jesus is actually quoting a psalm here. It's a psalm that every Jewish, devout Jewish family would quote daily, every evening. And it's found in Psalm 31, verse 5. And David writes this prayer, into your hands, he says, I commit my spirit. But Jesus prays this prayer or makes this statement like no one else. We, We find nowhere in recorded history that that any Jewish or religious people ever put Father in front of this verse. Uh, There's nowhere recorded in, in the pages of history where parents, Jewish parents, taught their children to even call their call God Father. 
But here Jesus says, Father, Abba Father, Daddy, Dad, into your hands I commit my spirit. And this is what drove the Pharisees crazy because Jesus would often use this intimate expression, Father, Abba, Father, Dad, to refer to their to God the Father. Now, uh, to me, it's very special. I, I had a great godly father who represented God in so many different ways. Some of you may be here and didn't have the benefit or the blessing of a godly father. But God is, uh, Jesus, excuse me, is modeling for us that we have a good father, a good, good father. Abba, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, what is also interesting is, is that the only recorded uh, expression that Jesus ever made when he was young, the only expression uh, before he began his ministry, before he reached the age of 30, we only have one account of what Jesus said in his early days. One account. And it's found in, in uh, Luke chapter 2. Verse 49, and notice what Jesus said. Now, he's about 12, 13, somewhere, a young teenager, somewhere, just a young, a young man. He says, and he has gone to the temple, and Mary and Joseph are looking for him. Uh, you're probably familiar with this passage of Scripture if you've been in Sunday school or if you're a student of the Bible. And here's what, how he responds when Mary and Joseph go, where have you been? And Jesus said, to them, why do you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Now, here's his earthly adopted father, so to speak. Joseph is standing right there. And what Jesus was saying is, Joseph, I love you, but you're not my real father. I have a heavenly father. And listen to me, church. You have a heavenly father that loves you, that cares for you, is crazy about you, that is a good father. Regardless of how you grew up, you have a good heavenly father. And Jesus said, I'm about my father's business. God is my real father. Now, listen, listen to me this morning. Uh, you're not ready to live until you're ready to die. Yeah. Amen. And you're not ready to die until you're ready to meet God. You're not ready to meet God until you know God as your father. And you do not know God as your father until you become, listen to me, his child. Yeah. And you do not become his child until you are born again. And you're not born again until you receive his son. Now, simply put, God only becomes your father when you become his child. Isn't that profound? And you only become his child when you receive his son. So the point is this, when you die, you want to make sure your heart is right. And if your heart is right, you will be connected to the Father's heart. And the only way you can be connected to the Father's heart is to receive Jesus Christ into your life as Lord and Savior. You hear what I'm saying, church? That's so simple, but it's so important that we grasp that. If you want to call on God the Father when you die, you must first call on Jesus as your Savior when you live. And so what Jesus is wanting to, the world to know is that he has a connection, a relationship with the Father. So here's an important question I want to ask you this morning. Are you 
connected to the Father's heart. The second thing that we need to grab hold of before we die is this. We need to be committed to the Father's hand. Notice in our text, we're going to give a little bit of different emphasis on this one sentence, on this verse. It says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I commit my spirit. Now, these are the last words that cross the lips of Jesus on planet Earth. These are the very last words. And hear me, Jesus is the only person who ever chose to die. Like I said earlier, you and I are going to die at one point, unless the rapture takes place. Uh, And we won't know when, where, how, for the most part. Even with a diagnosis, we don't know the exact moment, the exact day. But Jesus is the only one who chose to die. Most people who died uh, a, a crucified life, died of asphyxiation or dehydration. And Jesus didn't die of either. He didn't die involuntarily. Well, Pastor, how do you know that? Well, I want to point you to a verse that we find in John's Gospel, chapter 10 and verse 18, and look what Jesus said about his life, and he's speaking about his physical life. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from who? My Father. See, Jesus died voluntarily because he loved you, because he knew this was the only way that you could be redeemed and set free from the clutches of Satan and that sin has around you. Now, if you remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, this also shows us that he chose to die. I mean, look what he said in, in Matthew chapter 26. He says, do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? At any moment, Jesus could have called 10,000 angels to come to his rescue. But he chose not to. Why? Because you're a very special reason why. God's love for you is so vast, it's immeasurable. In fact, that's what the Bible says. Last week, we talked about it. How high, how wide, how deep is the love of God for you? And he endured the cross. He endured the shameful death to redeem us. He became the sacrifice, the lamb the Bible talks about. And being raised from the grave, we're going to talk about that next week. tells us that he is who he says he is. Now, what's interesting about this word in in this sentence, I commit, uh, that word in the Greek, some of you like the Greek words, but it actually is a fascinating word. It's a financial word. It's actually a banking term. When you were, it's used to deposit something of value. Like some of you may have a safety deposit box. You have some heirlooms or some valuables or something that's dear to you that you don't want stolen or taken. You put it in a safe place. And that's the word that we get here. And so some of your translations, if you're looking in your Bible, might use the term Entrust. I entrust my spirit to you. That would be a good translation. The word commit, safe place, entrust. You know, you've heard me say this a lot. In the Christian walk, every one of us are confronted almost daily with an important question on how we live, how we walk, what we do, what we say. Do I trust God? 
Do I trust God? I, you know, I, I don't know how I'm going to pay this bill. I, I don't know how this relationship is going to resolve. I don't know how to deal with my son. I don't know how to deal with my parents. Whatever it may be, do we trust God? I mean, what are our options? Trust Congress? I don't think so. Trust the culture of this world? No, it changes constantly. Trust the media? Uh, you may smile, but some people do. They, they base their whole worldview in what they receive from, from news, media, our world. Listen, the only person you can trust is Congress, uh, uh, is God. <laughs> I just woke some people up. Well, Martha, what did he say? We're supposed to trust Congress. No. no. You can't even trust yourself. Well, Pastor, I just I just go by my feelings. I, I you know how I feel about something usually directs me. Listen, your feelings will lie to you. Hello? You eat too much pizza. You're going to feel different about things, <laughs> one way or the other. The only person you can entrust your life to is God. You need to choose someone who has your best interest at heart, someone who knows everything like we talked about a few weeks ago, someone who is perfect, who will never lie to you. And that kind of limits your options, not to Congress, but to God. Hello? Amen? Here's what the Bible says about that. Look at Psalm 33, 4. It says, for the word of the Lord holds true. And everything he does is worthy of our trust. You can trust God. You may be in a circumstance where it looks like you have been forsaken of God. Do you trust God? Do you trust him? I was talking to someone not too long ago who said, you know, Pastor, I just, things are so bad. I, I, don't, I don't even know if I want to live anymore. I said to that person, man, you're in great company. I'm like, what? Great company? Yes, David wrote about that. Moses wrote about that. In fact, think about Elijah. He's hiding in a cave, wanting to die. What does God say to Elijah? Elijah, what are you doing in this cave? And that's where a lot of times we find ourselves. We go shrink into some cave. We hide out. When God has something great for you, a work for you to do, God has a plan, a strategy, a good work to accomplish in your life. Does that mean we won't ever face the challenges of life? No, we are going to face the challenges. They're going to confront us. But it comes down to this. Do I trust God? The psalmist says, he's worthy of our trust. You can trust God with your finances. You can trust God with your health. You can trust God with everything. And that's what Jesus is saying. Dad, I entrust my life. I, I put my life in a safe place the only one I can trust. I commit my life into your hands. You know, just a few verses past Psalm 31, 5, where Jesus quotes this psalm. Verse 15 says, my times are in your hands. I think that's an important verse that David wrote. 
listen, your time is not in the government's hands. It's not in your employer's hands. It's not even in some terrorist hands. God has a plan and a purpose for you, and he will accomplish it. And that's what David's saying. My times are in your hands, which is helping us to go to the third point. You see, God's hands are never full. God's hands never fail. God's hands never make mistakes. God's hands always do things right. And from God's hands, you can never fall. You can deposit your life into the hands of God. And when you breathe your last breath, he will keep it safe. Amen? That's good preaching, Pastor Nate. I'm just going to say it. In the final point, be confident in the Father's hope. You see, there's hope when we entrust our spirit into the Father's hand. He can handle anything we give him. In fact, he's like, bring it on. Cast your cares on me because I can handle your doubts. I can handle your complaints. I can handle your pain. When you think you can't handle any more, he can. And he doesn't fall off his throne backwards when we, we have a circumstance that looks impossible. He doesn't go, angels, can you bring me the holy Tylenol? He doesn't go, angels, why didn't somebody tell me about this? How did Pastor Nate get... He didn't call me Pastor Nate, but just for emphasis. <laughs> How did he get in this mess? Oh, my goodness. We need to have a board meeting up here. We need to figure out how we're going to get through this problem. God doesn't do that. God, you'll never hear God ever say, boy, that caught me by surprise. No. We can be confident and we can have hope in, our, in the God, our Father, Notice, Father, I'm going to use the NIV version because we talk, talked about entrust or commit. Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. Into your, there's something about that that just, you know, into his hands. You know, you know my dad has big hands. I, I was amazed... As a kid growing up, he could palm a basketball. Of course, my little 12-year-old hands couldn't. I'm amazed. Listen, God has big hands. Yeah. He holds the world in his hands. He's got the whole world. Somebody ought to write a song about that. He's got the whole world <laughs> in his hands. Hello? I mean, think about it. Somebody was telling me 12 point, there are stars 12.3 billion light years away. I think we talked about that last week. God created that. I think he qualifies to have big hands. If he can create stars and galaxies that are light years away, he can handle your problems. He can handle your situation. So don't look at your situation. Sometimes we take a snapshot of where we are, and, and, and we're, we freak out. Can you imagine Daniel in the lion's den? Suddenly he's there. Lions are surrounding him. He takes a snapshot and goes, oh, my. God, you've forsaken me. I, that's. That's what I would have done. <laughs> I know I'm a pastor, and you think I'm a man of great faith, but you look at snarling lions. No, God has it covered. He shuts the mouths of lions. He parts red seas. He has a way of cooling the fiery furnace of life. He knows how to break the bread and fishes of life to feed you, to meet your need. 
doesn't matter if it's inflation or recession. It doesn't even phase God. He doesn't care because you're the apple of his eye. You are so important to him, he's not going to let you starve. In fact, isn't that what David said? I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed out begging bread. Think about it. He's crazy about you. He sees it when you get flustered. Well, I'm not going to have enough. How am I going to pay for gas? I don't, it's, it's twice as much as it was a year ago. Well, I know I'm just going to cut back on my tithing. I'm going to cut back on giving. I'm going to start eating Roman noodles. Oh, God's bigger than Roman noodles. I mean, think about it. If you have to put flavoring in anything to eat it, there, there's something wrong with that picture. I don't know. My son, Jonathan, loves Roman noodles. He just likes them. I mean, like... This has nothing to do with the message, but he made some salmon the other day that was the best in the world. It was actually better than Joy's. Joy makes really good salmon. How many like salmon? We got a lot of fish eaters here at Frontline Christian Center. Look at that. My wife doesn't like salmon. She wants me to hurry and move on. How big are God's hands? And I'm closing. How big are God's hands? Well, two things I want to bring to your attention. His hands are big enough to bless you and heal you, set you free, turn your life around. His hands are big enough to do that. And I, in, in my notes, I have a, uh, there was a leper who came to Jesus and he said, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Now, I don't know if you know this, but if you read the Old Testament, especially those verses in the Old Testament that are dry and you're like, oh, why do I have to read this? It's got all the different codes and prescriptions about what you can do and not do. Well, one of the things that you can't do if you're a righteous person is touch a leper. It just makes sense. Leprosy is so contagious. It is extremely contagious. We, we, can't, we can't relate today because they have like three little tiny pills you take, it cures leprosy. But back in that day, it was worse than cancer or worse than any disease you can think of. Your fingers, your nose, your ears fall off. I was in India. I got to see Mother Teresa, but I was working with a missions organization over there with the, the Buntains, and they took us on a, on a missions trip to a, a different part of Calcutta. And I remember getting out and coming face to face with someone who had leprosy. And his nose was like moved to this side of his face, and he was missing hands and fingers, and he was begging Leprosy is a terrible thing. It's terrible. And he said, if you will, Jesus, you can make me clean. Amen. And I love this. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing Jesus is willing to touch you this morning. He's willing to make you whole this morning. If you will trust him. If you will reach out to him. Say, Lord, touch me. He will. Be clean. And immediately. Now, I love that about reading the Gospels because you, you see these words immediately, suddenly, uh, straight way. 
things like that, that suddenly things happen. And immediate, in this particular case, immediately, the leprosy was gone. I would have loved to have been there. Wow. Wasn't that he was lucky? No. It was a work of healing. The Bible tells us that God heals today. He bore the stripes upon his back so that we might be made whole. You are a prized possession in the hand of God. That's actually what the Bible says. Look at this verse in Isaiah. It's a powerful verse. The Lord will hold you for all to see. A splendid crown in the hands of God. You normally don't come to church and see me holding Preston, but he had fallen and hit his head. He wouldn't let anybody hold him. He was screaming. And I said, Preston, here, come to me. He held up those arms, and I held him for all to see. And some of you make cute comments and that type of thing. But Preston is precious to me. And that's what this verse is saying, how God sees you. You're precious to him. The Lord will hold you for all to see. A splendid crown in the hands of God. Those hands that created galaxies. Those hands that carved out the oceans and made the mountains are the same hands that hold you today. Yes, amen. Oh, they have nail-scarred hands because of his love for you. In fact, when we get to heaven one day, when we're in God's presence, we're going to witness that the only one that has any scars is Jesus because they represent his love for us. And their reminder, which is the second thing uh, about God that's so important. His hands are scarred to never forget me. Yeah. To never forget me. To never forget you. And as Byron comes to the platform to begin playing, you know, Feeney Crosby uh, was a great hymnist. And I took hymnology when I was in Bible college. Had to do a kind of a, a musical with just hymns. And one of the songs that I selected was I Shall Know Him. And began to do a little study of the background. If you don't know, Fanny Crosby was a very gifted, not only hymn writer, but pianist. But she was blind. Couldn't see. I mean, you, th you think of people like Ray Charles. You think of people like uh, Stevie Wonder. Can play beautifully. They're blind. Well, Fanny Crosby was much like one of these very gifted musicians and songwriters. She couldn't see. And so a group of young people came up to her one time and asked her a question that bothered her. They said, Fanny, look, you're blind. How are you going to know Jesus when you get to heaven? You can't see. How are you going to recognize him? Well, this bothered her. Kept her up at night. She couldn't sleep. That sense of being blind just overwhelmed her. And suddenly some lines and lyrics begin to flow through her mind. And she penned late one evening these important words to her cor chorus. It says, I shall know him. I shall know him. And redeemed by his side, I shall stand. I shall know him. I shall know him by the print of the nails in his hands. Oh, I can't see. But I'll know him because he'll be the one who has prints in his hands and in his feet and, and a spear 
scar in his side and the scars on his brow from where the soldiers pushed down that crown. And I close with this verse. Look at this verse. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion for the child she has born? But, she, but though she may forget, I don't know how that would be possible, but though she may forget, here's what God's saying about you. I will not forget you. Let me just stop right there. Some of you are here this morning. You feel like God has forgotten you. Or you've gone through something in your past and you feel like, well, God just forgot me. He, and, uh, God has not forgotten you. He looks after you. He cares for you. He is obsessed with you. He's constantly watching over you. I look so many verses that talk about the eye of the Lord. There are over 200 references about his hands holding you. Wow. A lot of promises. I will not. Some of you need to write this down and put it on the your refrigerator. I will not forget who? You. Didn't say Pastor Nate or one of the board members or one of the other pastors. He's talking about you. And he goes on to say, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Church, before we breathe our last breath, listen to me. You need to be in the hands of God. You need to be in the Father's heart. You need to know Him before you breathe your last breath. You need to know this God who is crazy about you. You really do. He loves you. He has great things for you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask just a very simple question, a couple of questions this morning. No, number one, you're here today and you've, you'll be honest, you've been going through the storm. You've been fighting the fight. It just seems like a little snapshot of circumstances. It looks like God has forgotten you. It looks like God has failed you. It looks that way. That's when we can't go on feelings. God hasn't forgotten you. He will never forget you. You say, Pastor, I just need a touch of God in my life in that circumstance, whether it's healing, financial, whatever it may be. And you'd be honest and lift your hand and say, that's me. I need God's touch. Right up, right down. Yes, yes, yes. God sees his hands. Anyone else? Right up, right down. Yes, yes. You've been going through it. It's been tough. You have felt like quitting. God wants you to know he's not forgotten you. He's with you. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But listen to me. The Bible doesn't stop there. It goes on to say, he'll deliver us out of them. Thank you. All. Oh. Oh. Don't base where you are, where God is at with where you are in your circumstance. The second question I want to ask is simply this. You're here this morning but you've never invited the Lord to come and live in your heart. You've never made him your Lord and Savior. If that's you, I'm going to ask you just to raise your hand right now. We're going to pray for you as well. Is there anyone? We always want to give you an opportunity to accept Jesus into your heart. Amen. And you don't have to do that at church. You can do that in your home or in a car. The Bible says that God, all those who call on me shall be saved. Before you breathe your last breath, I want to challenge you, church. 
know God. Know the Lord as your Savior. With every head bowed and every eye closed, we're going to pray. Father, you see the hands that were lifted this morning. Father, you see those that have, are going through tough times, are going through a struggle, circumstances, challenges. Father, you've seen the many hands that were lifted. Father, you're the worker of miracles. Father, you do the impossible. Father, you have a way of saying, I will be thou clean. And Father, we're made whole. And so, Father, right now, Lord, there are those that are here because you brought them here today to heal their lives, relationships, minister to them financially or, in, or in physically, whatever it may be. Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would touch and heal your people today with those big hands that you have and to remind us that, Lord, they're scarred because of your love for us. We give you praise for what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God is good. God is good. We want to give you an opportunity to continue worship and, and giving. Um, next week is an important week uh, for us. Easter. And I want to challenge everyone to invite someone to come. Uh, but it's really a big weekend also for our children and youth. And uh, I want to challenge you today. Uh, in addition, if you can give a little extra to help our children, you may even want to put four children. Uh, they There's a lot of toys and candy and, and gifts and things like that 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 we in faith have gone ahead and just purchased and trying to meet our budget. I told Kim, Pastor Kim and Pastor Chris, we're going to just step out in faith. But I want to invite you, if, if you've got an extra dollar or extra five dollars or you can bless us with, it will mean so much for our children and our youth. Amen?